It's howdy doody time. It's howdy doody time. Bob Smith and howdy too. Say howdy do to you. Hi guys. It's time to start yeah. the show. So kids, let's go. I wonder what year that was. <laughs> Probably about 48, 49. Anyway, let's reintroduce ourselves. Uh, uh, this is MalcolmPresents.com with Phil Margo, the Lion and howdy Roars. And Howdy Doody too. And Howdy Doody too. I remember, yes, I used to, Go ahead. I used to watch a Howdy Doody show with uh, uh, Mr. Filibuster. No, 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 no. I'm uh, getting uh, filibuster yeah. there. Mr. Bluster. Yeah, no, it, 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 no I, I forgot. Wait, how, howdy, duty, Buffalo Bob, Mr. Bluster. Mr. Bluster. Mr. Bluster. And, and Dilly Dally and the Dilly, Flubber Dove. And, 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 and uh, uh, great Princess song. Summer Fall, Winter Spring. Yes, Princess Summer Fall, Winter Spring. And great songs. Songs like What Kind of Animal Goes Quack Quack, A Duck Quack Quacks, A Duck Quack Quacks, and you can make your team a winner. You can make a turkey dinner. So delicious, you wish the meal would never end. But no matter how long it may take, the greatest thing you'll ever make is a friend. And, and all kinds of wonderful songs that, that really, along with the cowboy code, was a background for how to be a decent person. You know, I mean, uh, be kind to animals and treat them nice. Be kind to animals. That's my advice. Was all those songs that were on that show that told you how to be a person? Really? I, I remember, but my favorite show of, of that period, well, there were several of them, but one was Mr. I Imagination. Yeah, Paul Tripp. Paul Tripp. And he used to go in the. Uh... Mr. I Imagination, <laughs> the man with the magic reputation. You could see how music affected my life yeah. very early. And obviously it had an effect all the way through. It had an effect to those gold records on the wall and it had an effect to my career. And, you know, I started with Howdy because that was really the first music aside from the stuff that I played on the Victrola because we got a television set in 1948, I think, or 49. And Howdy, I think, started in 49. But it wasn't this Howdy. It was a funny looking Howdy. But then he, they, he had a facelift on Howdy, face and now we got, this, we got this Howdy now. This is the second Howdy. That, that, that looks a lot. Well, that's how it went when they designed the Ronnie Howard. He looks like Howdy Doody. Right, right. It's true. It's true. Right, it's true. But uh, so anyway, that's what led me you know, to, 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 to a knowledge of music that was ingrained in my soul, but I didn't know it. You know what I mean? I thought everybody did that and right as we discussed your your feeling for music was was an ape like uh i never when i listened to records i never heard the different instruments coming in and how they played with each other you did you you are a producer at five years old or earlier that's right it was it was, it was it's true i mean that's because i never studied it formally in school and you still music, haven't and music appreciation in school although it's interesting that it was part of every part of your school. You had music, I think I had music appreciation starting like in the fifth or sixth grade, you know, and it was called music appreciation. And it was an appreciation of music. And we did, um, we did things like practice with, with, with instruments. We went loud, soft, 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 loud, soft, soft, yeah. soft you know, and things like that to, I, I, to in introduce us to music, the concept of music. And, um, and that, even though I didn't excel in it as a kid, as a young kid, when I got to high school and I, and I, yeah, I told the story about getting yeah. into the blues chorus, and then I got involved in the varsity show and I got involved in the sing. Sing, and I, yeah. We, yeah we, sing. We, we went to the same high school a few years apart. Right. So no, I, we I, did. I, yeah. I, 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 I can relate to everything you're talking about. Right, sing, you know, and and, and we won, we won, we were the we were the first juniors to win sing. We beat the seniors because ah. we were an extraordinary class. There were some wonderfully talented kids in it, 
that were, you know, when I first got involved, that I, they were writing it, you know, they wrote all the lyrics, they, you know, they took songs that already existed, but wrote was, it, was, was Neil Sedaka or Neil Diamond in your class? They're a bit older Neil, than me. Neil Sedaka was a year ahead of me. Neil Sedaka was graduated, I think graduated, I think a year or two ahead of me. I don't think he was in school at the time I was, but I, I, I don't remember because I was so, I was so, Anonymous, right. you know, I, I was, I was like, you know, no one knew who I was. It, it didn't matter, you know. But then later on, I got more involved, and I and I got more involved with the with the showbiz side of the school, with the performing side of the school. I was on the track team, but now, but I was on the cross country team. Who cared? You yeah, know? nobody cared about. But, the but uh, anyway, the, the last time we left you, you you had your own office in uh, on Broadway. Well, that yes, that was that was in the Ed Sullivan building. Did um, you ever, that, by the way, did you ever see Ed Sullivan? No, but I knew, but I knew it, we. I met his producer. I met his producer, but no, I never saw. I mean, we they weren't putting groups like us on Ed Sullivan at the time. We were we were in that very strange gap where we couldn't perform anywhere because we weren't a folk group. And we weren't really a rock group. We, you know, Lion Sleeps Tonight, you couldn't call a rock and roll song, really. And, and so we didn't fit anywhere. And we didn't fit anywhere e even in the, in the large sway of things. I mean, we have all those gold records. Most people don't know that. You know, we're not, we weren't looked at at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as anything special that deserved consideration. But we did some amazing stuff. Are, 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 are the records for the, the songs that the Token sang or for the songs that you produced with other groups? You wrote Both. And produced. Both. I mean, Lawn Sleeps Tonight sold a million, oh, well over a million copies. Yeah. But we had, we had million sellers with the, with the Chiffons, with uh, Tony Orlando. You know, we had a lot. We may have, they have nine, nine of them up there or whatever they are. Uh, by the way, are, are they real gold? No, they're played. They go played, uh, shucks. And they're not even the record that they say they are okay like if you played we we once took one of our gold records in our room took over our office in, in in on 1697 broadway we once took one of the gold records down that were given to the tokens we each got gold records as individual yeah. um, you know our individual name is on each record but they also gave a, a, a got we made up extra ones for the tokens for us to hang in our office so we took one of them down. Um, it was, it was, and, and it turned out it was an RCA Sam Cooke record. When we, when we put it on the table. Okay. They, they, they go played it. They, they used masters, you know. Now, 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 let me get this straight. If you're the tokens, if you didn't write the music or the lyrics and you didn't produce it, you didn't get anything when the record played? No, not at that time. Now, now it's different. At that time, well, we, we, we got, today there's a place called Sound Exchange, which gets money for the artists, just like the produce, just like the writer and the publisher. The producer didn't get money from play at all. The producer got money from sales, you know, record sales. Okay. You had a percentage of the sales of the of the actual record. But, but the group we, didn't get. Did the group get a percentage of the sales of the record, or they didn't yes, get anything? Yes, we uh, still do. We still get a percentage of the Chiffon's records, Randy and the Rainbow. And, you know, we still get some of that. Of course, the tokens, Lion Sleeps Tonight, and the, the, that stuff, the stuff we did on Warner Brothers. Yes, but at that time they didn't have. They didn't give uh, uh, royalties to artists, so. Uh, you know, to, to the artist as, as a singer. And Sound Exchange now does that, which yeah. is really nice because the Lion Sleeps Tonight still gets played on all of the media. And, wow. and, and we receive, you know, I receive a check every, every actually quarter they come. Did you, know, you, they come. you get any royalties when Tom Warner sells it, uh, sells it as a group? You know, you see the gold oldies and, and you're always included on that. I think, what? It's, time, I think it's Time Warner. That has that commercial line for endless, and they do all the old rock groups. And yeah, we, all, we're in a lot of those. We're in, we're in those albums. Or we're in a lot of those. Yeah, uh, those uh, packages, sure. Man, and, and you get paid for that for, yeah. for sales. And and but at the time, 
the money we real we really made, which is which is a, a, a new topic. I'm leading you into a new topic. Okay. We got a call from a, an executive, Harry Sosnick, who worked at Ted Bates. Okay. And he called us up and he said, we want to take commercials and use the new teen lingo. That's how he put it, the teen lingo. Teen lingo, oh, the teen what lingo. What they were saying is they wanted to do commercials with modern, you know, with, with, instead of just after seeing his, saying clearly, clearly he knows his score. You know, they wanted to do a score commercial and other commercials with, with a rock background because the audience was growing up and these people who were teenagers are now, you know, consumers. Yeah. So we got involved. We, we did the commercials. We did the, a score commercial for, for, for Ted Bates. And then Foot Cone and Belding called us. And, and, and all the gray and all of the advertising agencies got on our train. And we did about 70 or 80, a lot of the major commercials for, for airlines and for, and for, um, um, toothpaste and score hair cream and 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 uh, general foods i mean we did everything we did we did uh, um uh, just a, a tons of commercials uh, chesterfield 101 cigarettes you know even the cigarette commercials back then and and we wrote them and produced them and uh, brexit we in fact we did a brexit commercial you know, Brexit, the hair, the hair yeah. thing, right? And it was, and they wanted a, uh, they wanted a, a rock and roll version of their commercial. And so we, we, they gave us money to do a demo and we got him, went into the studio and did our demo and we presented it. And, you know, they went, if you went body in your headset, water isn't enough Brexit for hair with body and lots of bounce. Water is in enough Brexit, you know. It was, it, it was, it's, it's got paid a royalty for that for our show. Well, what happened was they decided, yes, so we get we handed the demo into them and they said, it's perfect, we love it. So we said, okay, so what do you want? So we'll now go in and do the master. I said, okay, is there anything you want changed? No, no, it's perfect the way it is, do it exactly the way you did it. So we looked at each other, we said, but you already have it. And they said, no, but we need the master now. So we said, okay. Um, okay. And we went back and we went and we went to the studio and had them take the tape that we used and and run a run a a a, a, a dub that said master, master on it. And we handed it over and build them again. Uh, did you do you get paid? Pay and it ran for years. Was that a buyout, or did you get residuals for that? No, you got residuals. Residuals. You got, I mean, we we we've got checks in the mail as lead singers for commercials that were thousands and thousands of dollars. We made we made hundreds of thousands of dollars on commercials. Yeah, I, I, I and, for, for a while what? I was an associate producer for a TV commercials at a place called Daniel and okay. Charles. And, I mean, and I had a commercial all set with. Uh, uh, Jerry Mulligan was going to write the jazz music. If you remember yeah. Jerry Mulligan, sure, the saxophone. Yeah, and the client wanted to see it, so instead of Jerry Mulligan wasn't ready yet, he hadn't produced the the uh, the track yet. So we put uh, uh, a big country in there, bump 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 bum type of thing, mm -hmm. and the client loved it, and we had to buy that and scrap the Jerry Mulligan sound, and that was. Right. I mean, well, I tried. I, I all kinds of all kinds of wacky things happen doing commercials. And, and we, and, 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 you know, the way we did stuff was, oh, okay, we're done with this. We, we, we said, we just said, I, we don't want to do them anymore. You know, I don't know why, because we, because we were in it to the point where we were one of the people that they would go to if they, oh, you go, go to the tokens, right? The last commercial I wrote was for Tom McCann shoes. Okay. And, um, and I wrote and I did the recording and and they liked it very much. And the the guy who booked it, the the commercial, you know, the commercial production house who booked it gave me the check to pay for it, you know, to pay my fee. Yeah. And the check was too much money. He 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 overpaid me. And I was walking, I was I was outside. I remember there was a restaurant, great, great I forgot the name of the restaurant now, but it was right on Broadway. 
the, the, the guy, the original guy. And I was walking along the street and I opened up the envelope and I said, wow, there's so much money. And I walked up back to his office and said, you gave me too much money. And he looked at me stunned. And he said, I'm doing a, I'm doing a Pepsi commercial, you're doing it, right? Wow. Because, because of my honesty. But what happened was we moved to California. So I never did do the Pepsi commercial. Oh, yeah. You moved. You, you could have had one of those penthouses above Fifth Avenue. Yeah, now. I mean, I, you know, we moved. That was it. So, but we did. We had a whole very big career in doing commercials. How, how many years did you do that? Would you say? Uh, I would look. I'm. I would say probably from sixty four to seventy. About six years. Yeah. I did them. And my last one I did when we when we had split up, I did the Tom McCann commercial. Mm. I, 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 I picture you now. I don't know if you you watch TV that much, but watch all the news shows or anything after six o'clock in the news or documentaries. And they're all promoting things for seniors, you know, things that uh, yes. put you to sleep, uh, get you up. Uh, Everything. Uh, stop, stop, stop you urinating. Uh, male have you, erections, you, women have desires. I can picture then, you. I can picture you and your group, you know, in the seventies doing it, and they, you writing a song, and them showing your close-ups of you, and your different I mean, band members singing the song. They didn't back then. They didn't even care that much about seniors. They they did most of the most of the commercial were directed in a different direction. But, but they, now, if, if you take a look at the TV, show, wasn't even. TV what didn't care about seniors. Nobody cared about seniors no. until they became a, a large group, you know, and, and people were living longer. So seniors and seniors needed different stuff. You know? uh, yeah, so, well, I mean, well take take a look at TV now, especially during the, uh, the the news the news hours. Everything is directed for 50 plus. Sure, sure, sure. All of it, you know. Well, and it's, I, I, all, it's all directed at, at, at illnesses. I mean, most commercials, are, you know, are, are, are about this sickness or that sickness. Right. And every single drug they talk about can cause death. Right. You or, know what or, I mean? Worse. I, 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 it can cause a heart attack, a stroke of death. I, well, I, well yeah, we I, never had that. I, I love the no disclaimers. Ever, it's remarkable. But that's, you know, and we had to be very careful of what we said in a commercial because you have to tell the truth, you know. So you know, we did we did a commercial for um, Etch-a-Sketch. You know Etch-a-Sketch, yeah. right? That thing's still you know, big, I, I think. I have, yeah. one up, I have one up on my, on my you know, we, it's like this where you sketch stuff. Yeah, I, 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 I love that. You, you drew a picture right. and then you could erase it. We did a commercial for Etch-a-Sketch that ran for eight years. <laughs> we did, I went, I, I'll never forget it. I went. Oh, I went to Ohio Arts in Ohio. I, I, I would by that time I had a pilot's license and I had an airplane and I flew out to Ohio and I booked the thing and and it's a commercial that I that I wrote and it ran for eight ran for eight years. Wow! Magical silvery scheme. That's Ohio Arts. That cassette turned the dial and you'll see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Fun time starts with that. Just sketch a, a line appears. Magically turn it upside down, it's gone. You'll see Ohio Watts. Do do do, etch a sketch. Wow, we did, was... I mean, you know, so we did that. Was a big part of our, of our career. I mean, yeah. we made a lot of money, we survived because don't forget what happened was when the when the when the when the English records came in, you know, after we made records like, like Made He So Fine in One Fine Day and and, and, and records like that that were big hits. Then the English groups came in, I think in 64, whatever yeah, it was. That was a big hit and of the Beatles. They were playing American artists, you know? And we, were, and we, we, and we had like a, a cold spell for a couple of years. And then we came back with the happenings and, and then eventually Tony Orlando and Dawn. So we were making hit records even during that period, but we were cold and what kept us going was the money from commercials. Mm -hmm. That's what the money from producing, writing and the, and the residuals. The residual yeah. with the Schmitz beer. I mean, you know, as I think of it, there are there are probably a hundred of them that that you know that we did at least. And and I've heard a lot them. of them a long but, time. But getting back to your your, your record career, tell me about uh, Tony Orlando and Dawn. Well, 
Tony Orlando and us, we, we, in, the, in the early 60s, when we had Tonight I Fell in Love, our first hit record, and The Lion Sleeps Tonight, Tony had Bless You and Halfway to Paradise. You know, he had big hits written by Carole King. Yeah, and didn't he have wasn't his big one, Tall Yellow Ribbon? Was that Tony Orlando? No, that was late. That was, that okay. was, this, that oh. was Tony Orlando and Dawn. Yeah. Tony Orlando started with us in 61. We did record hops together. I remember we did one in, in, in Detroit. We did seven in one night or something, you know, and we would meet each other on, on flights going out to Chicago, you know, and, and, and stuff. And we got friendly and we got, we got successful as producers. And one day Tony came to, to our office and he said, he's really sweating. He, he's running out of money. You know, it was, it was years since his hits and stuff. And, and, so I called up my friend who worked over at Robbins Feist and Miller Publishing, and I got I got Tony a job. He'll never today. He'll never admit that it happened, but it happened. Well, we'll get him um, on the show and find out. I, I don't think so, but at any rate, he he uh, he got a job, and and then and then eventually he turned that job into a job with April Blackwood, which was a Columbia Records publishing arm. So, you know, so now he's over at April Blackwood as a song plugger, right? And we find this song, Candida, and I think it's a hit record. I think it's a hit song. So I'm saying, I'm telling everybody, we got to record this song. The drifters have cooled off, and this is a drifter record. We make, we simply make a drifter record. So we got one of the guys that used to hang out at our office. We, 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 we put up the money for a track. And we, and we made a track and put the guy on and the label didn't like it. And he asked us to get somebody else that they love the song, but they don't like the artist. So then we went and talked to Tony and we said, why don't you just throw your voice on this? It's very much in your, in your groove. It's perfect for you. And, and, you know, and if, and if you don't, and if it's a hit, you can decide what to do. You could do nothing or you can make another one or whatever, you know? So he, at first he didn't want to do it, but then we finally convinced him and we put him on Candida and the rest is history. Candida knocked three times, tie yellow ribbon, so, uh, uh, sweet gypsy rose, you know, he had all those sets. And, and, and you know, he'll, he'll never tell that story. Well, was, that, was, that, was that the only one you produced for him or did you, were you involved with any of the other? Was that, were you involved with any of the other songs that he did? Any of the other records? No, no, not not not, not subsequent to hmm. to not tie, tie a little ribbon. Oh, oh, you, you know, we broke up. Oh, we you broke up. Uh, oh, you did. We tie had yeah. when we broke up the tokens as a group. When yeah. we broke up, we had five records on the charts. But one of the members of the group, Hank, who was there at the beginning had been telling everybody in the industry that he did all the work and we did nothing. So everybody believed him and he went out and made deals with people behind our back and then he quit. Right. But as, he, as, but as he the, took everything with him. As, as a singing group, the tokens or as producers? As he quit, he quit everything. Right. He quit everything and, and, took it, and took this stuff with him because he had everybody convinced that he was doing all the work and mm -hmm. we were sitting around playing with Ayalitzes. And the bottom line was there was magic in the four of us. And there was something there that was just, it was a magic combination. My father always said that. He said, there's the four of you have magic, all of you equally. And I believe that was true. We each had a function. You know, I mean, we each were, were responsible to a great degree for, for each one of the records that we made. We each had a certain responsibility and it was a very balanced situation and it would have went on for years if he didn't break us up. We could have been Geffen. We could have been, because we were starting to sell albums. And in 1970, we were the second hottest producers in the industry. Wow. We had almost 2% of gross and income, 70 or 71. 2% of the gross income were our records of the right. whole record industry. You know what that would amount to today? Or whatever, you know, I mean, and, and just Hank, just, uh, I'm not gonna get into the yeah. evil of it, but um, the group broke up and we all had to 
kind of the rest of us were left without our reputation because he told everyone in the industry that we He's didn't do one, anything. The one man show. So uh, uh, he 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 was making all kinds of deals all over the place, and we found it hard to find to survive, you know. Um, and ultimately, he he made a couple of he had a couple of records that did something. He did out. Uh, he did a few things that was fairly successful, but that was it. You know, I think altogether we could have made hits till today. We could have still been making hit records. Well, it reminds me of, uh, you know, in, 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 in sports world, you know, when, when uh, uh, Magic and uh, Shaq broke up. When Shaq yeah, right. Up. They, they could have had. <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was like we were, we were equal, except that he took away our, he took away our reputation. Yeah. There, 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 there are certain there are certain combinations that as a team that the teamwork work marvelous to take one thing out of the team it doesn't and work it doesn't work well it certainly didn't work for us we didn't we didn't um, um, we didn't get any real chances to do things because nobody believed we were we could we could you know well, well you had um, been uh, when I met you guys, actually, I didn't meet the, all the tokens. I met you and your brother, Mitch. So Mitch was still with you at the time, right? Yeah, well, what happened, well, the interesting thing that, interesting thing that happened, which, which I guess we're, we're getting down to the end of the show now, but it, it'll lead us into the next part of my life because the guy who wrote Denise, Neil Levinson, came to us and said, to, to, to Mitch and I and, and said, let's do a skateboard album. Skateboard? You no, know, a skateboard album, because skateboarding was becoming very popular. So we sat down and wrote about 11 or 12 skateboard songs. We got a group together. We made a deal with a record company to put up the money, minimum money, like, you know, 15 grand or something. And we did a skateboard album. And Syndicast, which was a syndicator of shows, heard it and loved it and said, we should do a TV special on skateboarding because it was starting to become very successful. You know, it was first starting to get hot. And, and here's one of those feather for, for, Forrest Gump moments. So they said, find a host, right? Find a host and we'll do the show with the group and the whole thing. So my wife is on the phone with a friend of hers and she's talking to her friend and her friend's daughter is hearing the conversation. And her friend's daughter says, why don't you get Chrissy McNichol? So, of course she was very, you know, she was on family. She was very athletic. She did all the athletic stuff and they said, and, and she was right, it was perfect. So we got a hold of Chrissy McNichol and that was the, major, the major event that sent my whole career into a different direction. Uh, I, 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 yeah. it, it changed my entire life completely. I see that, I see, I see that feather floating around. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, it was, it led to, I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about really is to all of this is the people that I worked with and 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 had the pleasure of knowing, you know, and meeting. And well, well, well. I, I, actually, what I want to do eventually, towards you know, as as we get more into and you get you, I'd love yeah. to have uh, to contact some of the people that you have worked with, and in each show. You know, you talk to them, talking about what you did, what you're going, what you're going to do. Yeah, have them I mean, on was, camera. My my life was fascinating. It really was. It was absolutely fascinating. I mean, uh, you know, I, I just I, I I'm amazed at it. You know, when I when I consider everything that happened, and everything that surrounds me, my family, my kids. Most of my kids, all my 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 kids are are musical. You know, my 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 they they. They're talented. They, you know, I mean, it's just, it's lovely to see. Yeah, you know, I, I, I know that some of the, some of your kids are part of the, the tokens that you, uh, yeah. when, when you do performances. Yes, they, well, well, Noah was in the group for 20, 20, you know, for, since, since for at least 20, 25 years. 
Since when he was in, he started when he was in college. Mm -hmm. One day Noah said to me, Dad, can I take your drums to, to the fraternity house? And I said, sure. And he took my drums and we were doing some work and the, the one, the drummer that we had with us couldn't make it. So one of the guys said, why don't we try Noah? And he came, he did the gig with us and he was working with us ever since still. The, the, the we rest of history. Anymore, we'll be well, we have to have him on the show one day. Absolutely. Anytime. I, I, I'd like to see, to, I, I'd like to see, you know, some of the people who are, are still around, you know, that we contact. I mean, if you have the number where we can call up their agent. And, and, I don't uh, know. I don't know if I can well, find him. I know you don't know. That's what I'm saying. Well, you, fa you found Howdy. And he looks just as good as he did when I saw him on TV. Because I was a member of the Howdy Doody Club. Did you? Have, I have I have Howdy Doody car keys. I have Howdy Doody. I have all kinds of Howdy. Oh, Doody okay. Stuff. Were you ever on the in the peanut gallery? Yes. Really? Was I ever? No. No, you never. You never sat in the peanut gallery. Well, I was. I was never in the peanut gallery, but I would have loved to do it. Yeah. You know. It, I know all the songs. Um, my goal I, once. I, I, I even wrote a Howdy Doody show for today. I even wrote, I wrote, a, I wrote a, 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 it would be a movie. I wanted to get um, um, Adam, Adam Sandler to play Buffalo, the new Buffalo mm -hmm. Bob. And Howdy Doody is in a museum in Detroit. And, and he gets awakened because of the world being in a terrible state, forgetting all the things that Howdy Doody sang about, and Princess Summer Fall Winter Spring is missing. Uh oh. So, so it becomes an adventure, and and it will, and uh, you know everybody, you know, I couldn't, and I actually got to Adam Sandler to, to tell, yeah. you know, his office was interested enough to hear the hear what I wanted to do. And I actually met, and I met Adam Sandler because of it. It never, it didn't, get, it didn't happen. But you know, it's still uh, a wonderful little story. Uh, who, who owns the rights to Howdy Doody? Uh, is he public domain I think, or? I think it's, I think it's a, it goes back to NBC. NBC. Yeah. Anyway, if you just heard that little alarm go off, we've been on for a half hour already, thirty-five minutes. Believe well, me. Well, look it up. Well, next week, next time we have some more stuff, and and uh, and I hope people enjoy us. Yeah. I, I, I've heard some, some from some folks that's heard the show that really liked it. Yeah, just so, tell, yeah. tell people you either can go malcolmpresents.com and, and, and then scroll down and it's uh, Phil Margo. If you, and if they know you, they you know your name. You don't have to do that. You could, you could put Phil Margo, The Lion Roars YouTube. in the search engine and it'll show up. Yeah, or you go to YouTube. Yeah, you can go to YouTube, but I'm going to I'm going to try to get it on more places. Now I have my I have my grandsons working on figuring out how to get the show to uh, to uh, buzz. What is it called? Buzz. Buzz something in my, my brain. Buzzsprout. Yeah, but, but, Buzzsprout. But, but Buzzsprout is only audio. I want audio and video. Audio is fine. Yeah, but this is I want, I want my, my my cousin listen to the show on his phone while he was running and he loved it and you know and i just oh, sent oh, him uh, you know so he could so it could go audio it yeah, well, yeah well, I, everything is audio also yes so you know but we'll but, but i'm working thing, on it again just to be a, a commercial what i want is i wanted to come over here and malk presents and then for people watching then you can advertise on our station yep well that's what i'm trying to do because, I'm working on it. Okay, sounds good. I mean, we're, okay. this, this you might next, be your please. next. This might be your next uh, success story. Ooh, you, you never know. I'm yeah. working on it. Okay, I'm good. trying. I'll speak to you next week. Bye. Bye.